We're not calling the orthopedics who did that idiots, but it's not an idiopathic scoliosis. It's oh! This is mostly... There we go. Yes. Axes into the apex of this scoliosis, creating, in biophysics terminology and mathematical terminology, a catastrophe. So, I've been getting a lot of questions and also comments about people asking for me to give my thoughts on chiropractors and their adjustments on patients with severe scoliosis. There's lots of videos out there. I happened to come across one, and then today I'm going to react to that chiropractor's assessment and his kind of adjustment of this patient. Let's check it out. Chiropractor Dr. Gregory Johnson, and we have Haley here with us today. And Haley's here to see us for her scoliosis, and she's got a pretty severe scoliosis. It actually measures 37 degrees by the Cobb angle method with the apex at T6, T7 on the right convexity, and then down in the lumbar spine, and the convexity is to the left with the apex at L1 and L2, and that it measures 45 degrees by the Cobb angle, which is pretty significant scoliosis. So the numbers that he's throwing out there, the 37 degrees in her thoracic spine, as well as the 45 degrees in her lumbar spine, well, these are measurements that we take as clinicians to assess how big a patient's curve is. So in scoliosis, all that means is that there's an abnormal curvature in the spine. No one's born with a relatively straight spine. Everybody has some little maybe twist in their spine. A lot of patients have what's called spinal asymmetry. This is a curve that you measure or a little abnormal cur curvature in their spine that's less than 10 degrees. Anything over 10 degrees is considered scoliosis. We measure these on the patient's x-ray. We use these numbers to help us guide our decision making when we're trying to decide what's the best treatment for patients. If a patient has a scoliosis of a certain degree, that doesn't mean that patient needs treatment or they need surgery. You have to take into account a lot of other things, how much growth they have remaining, what is the underlying cause of that scoliosis? There are lots of different causes for scoliosis and as a clinician and as a physician, you have to understand what's causing that scoliosis so you can treat it effectively. Because if something is causing the patient to have a scoliosis and it's in their spinal cord or in their brain, well, doing any type of adjustments or treatments will not treat that patient. You're doing that patient injustice. And this is your sixth treatment so far, huh? Mm -hmm. And your numbers are pretty low. Mm -hmm. That's good. So that's looking good. Let's mm -hmm. have you face the mirror here. We're going to check your posture first. Let's have you close your eyes, Haley, and bend your head forward and backwards for me. And then neutral. Okay. Hold still for just a moment. When, whenever we are examining patients in our office, we're always kind of looking, like you said, at their posture. We're looking at their shoulder level because a patient can have scoliosis and one shoulder is higher. This can be very cosmetically uh, not really appeasing for a lot of patients and they come in and they're reporting like, hey, I'm 13 years old and my shoulder's high and people are making fun of me at school. So it's definitely something that we look for. You look for the rib hump or how uh, asymmetric a patient's uh, ribs are because the larger the curve, the larger that uh, rib hump may be. Okay, you can see her head's translated a little bit to the left of center and her body's kind of tilted off to the right here. That's a part of the scoliosis. Her pelvis has shifted to the right of center. You don't see any room here, but you see quite a bit of room over here. And that's because her apex of her scoliosis goes way out to the left over here pushing her pelvis way over to the right so the very best treatment that we provide for any scoliosis patient and they called yours an idiopathic scoliosis at the orthopedics office right mm -hmm. and we found out by looking at your x-rays that it was not idiopathic it was actually because of structural misalignments correct mm -hmm. yeah so we're not calling the orthopedics who did that idiots, but it's not an idiopathic scoliosis. Wow. 
Oh man, so lots of different causes of scoliosis. The most common cause, 70 to 80%, is called idiopathic scoliosis. This means there's really no cause for it. We can't figure out what's causing the patient to have scoliosis, whether this is genetics, whether this is something uh, that they just they were born with, um, you know, hereditary. We don't know the cause. Lots of other different causes of scoliosis. You can have neuromuscular scoliosis. These are patients who have like cerebral palsy or some type of underlying issue in their brain or their spinal cord that causes their spine to grow crooked. Other causes of scoliosis, you have adult causes of scoliosis, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. It's for patients who are 13 to 18 and sometimes a little bit younger than that. There's congenital scoliosis, early onset scoliosis. So lots of different causes of scoliosis. Majority of them, that's what the literature supports, that majority of them are idiopathic. We just don't know what causes them. And really there's no way to look at the x-rays and say your cause of scoliosis is because of structural misalignments. And then adjusting your treatment plan based off of that. So we look at the x-rays, we look at the curve, most curves, especially in the thoracic spine, are going to the right. So if a patient has a curve that's going to the left, that tells me that we need to look at some underlying neurologic causes for that patient's scoliosis. So that's one thing that you can look at the x-rays and say, hey, a patient has a left-sided thoracic curve. There's an incidence of neurologic neuroaxis abnormalities with this uh, left-sided curve, so we need to further evaluate this. Whether this is a cernix, which is a cyst of fluid uh, inside the spinal cord, or something more up in the brain, uh, you need to search for that underlying cause. And we really appreciate you subscribing to our new channel and sharing it with your friends. Just breathe through your nose. Oh, yeah. You feel that all the way down? Okay. Oh, man. There we go. And yes, she's still kicking a little bit, not much. So right now he's trying to check her reflexes. These are can be abnormal in some patients who have uh, spinal conditions. So uh, he's hitting on her patella reflexes to uh, check them. <laughs> hanging on. Yeah. Not hangover, hanging on. There we go. Yes, very nice. You like that a lot better, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not sure of doing the adjustments to the neck the way he was doing it uh, does anything for your scoliosis. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm missing something, and um, but not sure how that kind of plays into her uh, scoliosis and treats her scoliosis. So this is the y-axis, and and I'm going to give you an example. If I had a crooked chain that looked like a snake that went from here up to her head. And I nailed that chain in right here and lifted straight up on the chain. What would happen to the chain? Straighten it out, wouldn't it? Well, you have a chain of 24 freely movable vertebrae in your spine from your skull down to your pelvis. Let's come over this way now and you tell me. So, the principle works the same. I don't think that's how it works. So, several different causes of scoliosis as we discuss. Some scoliosis curves are flexible, which means they're not rigid. And other ones are structural, which means they're rigid curves. Pulling on someone's spine or adjusting someone's spine will not correct a patient's scoliosis, especially in scoliosis curves that are very rigid. She's a young patient. She most likely has a flexible curve but what we do as surgeons, we evaluate this with bending x-rays. We have the patient bend over to see how much of that curve actually corrects. We haven't been the other way to take another x-ray to see how much it corrects. That tells me as a surgeon, before, if this patient ever needed surgery, a lot of patients don't, but if this patient ever needed surgery, um, that tells me how aggressive I need to be in the operating room and correcting her curve. If you can imagine, as, as a surgeon, uh, I'm in the operating room and I just did a case like this two weeks ago on a 16-year-old patient. This patient had adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the most common cause of scoliosis, which is idiopathic. We, as surgeons, it takes, I'm a very, I feel like I'm a very strong person. It, it takes two people 
me and another surgeon to actually correct the patient's rotational deformity of their spine. Scoliosis is a three-dimensional condition. There's abnormalities in the sagittal plane, like we're looking at the patient from the side. There's an abnormality in the coronal plane. This is just the curve that everyone is used to seeing. And also there's an abnormality in rotation. The spine actually rotates. So in surgery, I'm actually using instruments to really push on the spine to try to correct that curvature or that rotation of the spine. And it takes a lot of force to do that. And a lot of times this is after we do what's called osteotomies. We're using different instruments to break up the bone, to make it more loose and more mobile so that we can actually correct the spine to get it into a better position. So doing this on the patient in, in a office setting, when you're pulling on their neck or you're pushing on different structures, this is not going to correct the patient's spine or this is not going to get it into a better position. I, I don't buy into that. The problem with these scoliosis is that a lot of people grow up with these things from childhood. So that's why it's really important to get your children checked early because if you uh, are in gymnastics or any kind of sports activities when you're young and you misalign your spine and you don't correct those misalignments or subluxations, they can develop into functional scoliosis, which is a painful and serious condition. But they can be helped early on and prevented with proper chiropractic care. I agree. Care. A lot of the scoliosis, patients who have scoliosis, if left untreated, it can cause a lot of pulmonary issues, back pain, disability, cosmetic. Uh, problems. Uh, it can lead to various, there's some theories out there, it can lead to arthritis and back pain. So yes, I agree with that part. I'm not just sure, I'm not very positive or I, maybe I just, I, I'm not sure of the research or the literature that supports chiropractic care for patients who have scoliosis to try to prevent that scoliosis from, from progressing. We know from our literature as spine surgeons that if a patient has a curve that reaches a certain threshold that it will progress about one degree of progression per year. For treatment for patients who have scoliosis, there's different logarithms for this treatment. So if a patient has a scoliosis that is less than 10 degrees, we don't consider that scoliosis. If a patient has a curve that's less than 20 degrees, a lot of times we can just watch these with serial x-rays. You can treat them with some therapy, sure, and then you have to watch it to make sure it doesn't progress. If a patient has a scoliosis between 20 degrees and 40 degrees, roughly, a lot of these patients, especially if they're young and they're adolescents and they still have growth rem remaining, we could treat these patients in braces. And that brace, essentially, they have to wear it up for a number of different hours per day. Studies show that uh, patients who wear it up to 16 hours per day can be over 90% effective. But most patients wear it around seven to nine, 10, 10 hours a day. Um, and then that helps to, while they're growing, that their spine kind of corrects uh, in a better uh, position and alignment. If a patient has a scoliosis over 40, 45, 50 degrees, those are the patients that we discuss having sur surgery, especially if they have a lot of growth remaining. I've seen patients in my office, they're in their 40s or 50s and they have scoliosis of 50 degrees, 60 degrees. Those patients may not need surgery and a lot of those patients I'm just watching. Um, they're, they're being treated with some therapy, some medications, anti-inflammatories, and they may have occasional flare-ups of their pain, but we're just watching them. I get x-rays every six months or every year just to make sure that that curve or that scoliosis doesn't progress. So just because a patient has a curve of 60 degrees does not mean that patient needs surgery or that that patient needs some type of therapy. A lot of patients can get along just fine without anything. Okay, you're gonna feel your pelvis pop up here and relax. Just your left SI joint first. And see her right SI joint, because of it having more of the weight bearing on it, has internally rotated as well. And her sacrum straight down away from L5. And I'm going to adjust her L5 straight P to A here. There. Uh, uh, I 
don't know what to think about that. Uh, adjusting a patient's lumbar spine. There's ligaments, there's uh, bones that hold it pretty stable. There's muscles, uh, all different tendons that hold it stable. Um, adjusting a patient's spine like that, trying to get it into a better position, going from posterior to anterior. I don't know if I buy that or not. And I'm also putting a little bit of right to left drive into it just because the scoliosis apex is out to the left here in her thoracolumbar spine region and then excellent and just breathe mm -hmm. good okay yeah i still got one right here okay Chucky. So I'm going to do a new adjustment on you today okay. uh, that you haven't had done. It's new to you, like, not to me. Let's have you lay on your right side and put your right hip on top like, of this pad. To to Again, I'm going to create a pre-stressed area here in her thoracolumbar spine by elevating her pelvis here. Thoracolumbar spine is just the area of the spine between the thorax, which is your chest region, to your lumbar spine, which is your lower lumbar, uh, lower part of your spine. Right there. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to come directly down into the apex of this scoliosis, creating in biophysics terminology and mathematical terminology, a catastrophe effect. And catastrophe is not bad in this situation. Okay, let's go with your back now. A catastrophe effect in mathematics and physics is pre stressing an area and then creating a maximum. Point of leverage there and I got some more movement even out of her spine doing it that way so now we're gonna adjust her from the lower end here you just breathe and relax there you go and same thing here nope that's not it nope that's still not it breathe boy making me work for you today huh okay so now I'm gonna adjust her Cervical thoracic spine back in the X, Y, and Z axis. Oh! This is what mostly is what is it? externally in, uh, rotating on the X oh. axis and then also no. uh, backwards on the Z axis. Straight down just a tiny bit right there. Good. And put your arms out like this. Now when you have scoliosis with those big cob angles, you get misalignment. Not only in the costal vertebral area. Oh my so god, looks like he's doing CPR. But also up front here. Holy in the crap. Look at her face. Areas where the oh. is attached to the sternum. And those are a little sore, aren't they? Especially oh this god. guy right there. Yeah. Okay, nice deep breath in. Let all your out. Now I'm just pulling her stomach back down through her diaphragm a little bit to open up that area in her lungs and let her breathe a little easier. Huh? Okay, one more time. <laughs> Exhale. Great. Hang on, let me just check to make sure you got one more pelvic adjustment right here. I'm adjusting her anterior superior iliac spine here, or ASIS. I'm just not sure what you can adjust of the ASIS. This is a area of the pelvis, a little part of the bone that muscles attach there. I'm just not sure what you can adjust there. There's no joint there. I don't know. Very good. Okay, now let's hit you up toward Joseph. <clears throat> I like how her hand is just flopping down all in the, the, the uh, breeze. In how many years have you been dealing with your scoliosis, Haley, to, for our YouTube fans that you've known I about? I don't know. I just remember when I was little, I would go to the doctor. 
and they told you you had it back yeah, then. Yeah, and but then my but mom never. But nobody's ever done anything about it. Yeah, my mom didn't want to put me in a brace because I was a rebel. Well, that's kid. good. <laughs> that's good. She mentioned that she was a rebel and she didn't want to wear her brace. Well, that's pretty common. Compliance is a big issue when patients are being treated for scoliosis with braces. They just don't like the braces. They want to look cool like everyone else. And wearing a brace, uh, you know, doesn't look very cool. But they, there's some cool stuff out there that they can custom make for you in terms of bracing. But I truly believe in bracing. There's great studies out there, lots of great studies that show that bracing actually works. And it's smart not to be getting any Harrington rods put in there unless you have organ pathology or heart disease. We don't use Harrington rods anymore. I don't know any surgeon that uses Harrington rods. These are just long rods. You can't really uh, bend them or make any um, adjustments to them in surgery to correct for a patient's alignment and their kyphosis or the lordosis. That's why a lot of patients were put um, in these long rods and they have flat back syndrome. So. We don't use these rods anymore. There's lots of different new technologies out in terms of rods that we use that we're able to contour to the patient's anatomy. So, not Harrington rods. Because of that. Uh, okay, good. Let's go ahead and have you stand in front of the mirror. We had a patient's family bring a really, really severe scoliotic patient in last week. It's like she hit forward and backwards. And the orthopedic and neurosurgeon wanted to put a Harrington rod from the skull all the way down to the lumbar spine and pelvis. But this, this child of 14 has not even fully developed yet. Look up. We'll do a little tap there. I just love these facial expressions that she's there. making while he's post doing post all this. Uh, I found it really post. hilarious. No. <laughs> Now let's try that same thing again. Yeah. Very nice. Now look here. See how it's more even now? Mm -hmm. You got equal spacing yeah. down here now instead of it being shifted way to the mm -hmm. right. And your shoulders are level too. So this is how we take care of severe, moderate, severe scoliosis patients. Wow. So as a recap, scoliosis um, is a abnormal curvature in your spine. We use certain parameters to help us guide our decision making, whether this is non-operative, we send patients to therapy, majority physical therapy, and whether this is uh, a patient who has a flexible curve and they're adolescent and they still have growth remaining, while well, some of these patients can be treated in braces, other patients who have curves that are pr fairly large, over 45, 50 degrees that have growth remaining, a lot of these patients will require surgery just because that curve will continue to progress. Other patients who are, you have degenerative scoliosis, that patients who have large curves, that doesn't mean that they need surgery. And I send a lot of these patients to physical therapy or you know other modalities to kind of treat the symptoms from the abnormal curvature of the spine. So I'm a very conservative surgeon. I give op patients options, you know, what type of therapy would you like to undergo? If patients who had good experiences with chiropractors, I recommend patients to uh, continue doing things that uh, works for them. So if something's working, it keeps you from going to the operating room, then you should continue doing that until it's not working anymore. But I just wanted to give my thoughts on this. Uh, scoliosis is a three-dimensional condition. Um, I personally don't buy into doing the adjustments to align the spine. He said her shoulders are more level, her leg lengths are, you know, more equal now. I, I'm not, I don't know. Maybe somebody sent me some articles or research that shows that, that it actually works. But I send patients to uh, therapy all the time. I'm a very conservative surgeon, so I was just curious about what happens if I have a patient who has scoliosis and they go to a chiropractor. But what are your thoughts? Put it in the comments below. Everyone else, thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. We'll see you next time.